Welcome everybody. It's April 5th, 2022, the first Tuesday of the month, which is reserved for the Bakey CV Live with a focus on atrial fibrillation. Uh, coming to you from the studios at Houston Methodist Hospital on the campus of Texas Medical Center. And I'm Dr. Randall Wolf, your host, and I'm a member of the, the Bakey Cardiac and Vascular Center team. My specialty is in arrhythmia procedures. Um, I want to get right to the important thing, which are questions from you all. If you have a question or even a comment, you can join us live. This is a live broadcast. It will be broadcast continually or be available continually after it's over, but you can call in now. And there are two ways to join us. One is by your phone. You take out your phone and you go 37607 and then the text box hit the bakey. D-E-B-A-K-E-Y. You'll see this on the screen as well. If you're on the computer, go to pollev, that's P-O-L-L-E-V.com, enter the bakey and respond to the activity. So you can join us by text or by the web with questions or comments. I urge you to uh, send your questions in early uh, to make sure we can get to all the questions by the end of the hour. Um, I was having a discussion with a, a patient of mine uh, recently. Uh, her name is Lisa Pierce and she's from the uh, uh, near, I guess about an hour from Savannah, Georgia, from the great state of Georgia. And she had been through a lot on her AFib journey. And it seemed like a good story to tell because it's a common situation that I encounter in my practice. And so the topic of, of the day is previous ablations and then a mini maze. And Ms. Pierce is now a year out, so that's a good time to reflect on what's happened uh, throughout her journey. Uh, Sandy Schreymeyer had somewhat similar experience in that she had failed ablations and then went to the mini maze. So this brings up a lot of questions. Why? Why after three ablations uh, does, the, does the heart still have AFib? Why didn't it work? I mean, you wouldn't have your gallbladder taken out three times, would you? Uh, so what's going on? And then what are your options? And there's a difference between what you might hear from the EP side versus what you hear from our side in the AFib Center. Lots of questions, uh, but a good way to get into it is with the story. Uh, as you know, this uh, is a way for us to get the word out to you to discuss these problems. Um, this was the brainchild of Dr. Lumsden, our fearless leader at the Bakey Heart and Vascular Center. And we get a good response every month, lots of good questions. There are no bad questions. So again, we'll put it on the screen one more time. If you're on the, your phone, you go 37607 and then you text the Bakey. If you are on the internet, or, or I'm sorry, not internet, but if you are on your computer, uh, you can join by the web. Go to pollev.com, enter the Bakey, that's D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, and respond to the activity. So with that, I did want to show you one other thing before I start talking to uh, Lisa. I'm going to go to my slides. And this was a case a few years ago. This patient had three catheter ablations and then came for the mini maze. And although it may be hard for you to understand this, uh, you'll see the yellow arrow pointing to RSVP. RSVP stands for right superior pulmonary vein. And this is the view that I have with the scope. So I'm looking at the pulmonary vein and you'll notice a, a few white spots here and there. On the right side of the picture, you see left SVP or LSVP, which stands for left superior pulmonary vein. And you'll see a little white spot. What are these? These are the areas where the previous, one of the three previous ablations made a spot that went all the way through to the outside of the vein. But the key here is not the spot. 
The key is all the area where there are no spots. Now, electrophysiologists often will say, well, we isolate all the veins, but then they reconnected. And I disagree with that. The, the veins don't reconnect. They never unconnected. Now, the inside of the heart is probably burned up or frozen, and it's hard as a piece of formica. But that energy usually doesn't transmit all the way through to the outside of the vein. So you get this very incomplete ablation, even after three ablations. And this leads generally to atypical left atrial flutter and continued atrial fibrillation. In addition, uh, as uh, some, uh, yesterday, a patient with a previous cryoablation, uh, only one of the four veins was isolated when we tested it on the outside of the heart. Inside of the heart, it might have been quiet, but it wasn't treated all the way through. And that patient also had a very, also had a very active left atrial appendage. As soon as we did the ablations, the way the mini maze is done, and closed the appendage, no more ectopy, no more AFib, no more A-flutter. Uh, that was yesterday as a procedure that took about two hours and 10 minutes, and the patient um, will go out tomorrow to the hotel. So here's what it looks like electrically. Uh, this again was the same patient. You see two lines, a top line and a bottom line. After a catheter ablation, that bottom line should be flat, but it's not. You see the spikes. So the veins are not isolated, not the superior or the inferior or the bifurcation. That second line should be flat, no black marks. The clamp is placed. This is during the mini maze. And here you can see the lines. It takes about 12 seconds to make one of these lines. And then we test again. Now look at the second line. It's flat as a pancake, <clears throat> nothing. The top line is the surface EKG, but the second line is blank, and blank here, and blank here. So finally, those veins are truly isolated. Now let's go back, we'll stop the slides there. This just shows the putting in the link, which is the way I can follow patients who've had uh, the mini maze procedure. And uh, with that introduction, uh, I'd like to welcome Lisa to our show. First of all, thank you for taking the time out and being willing to join us. And I think maybe the best thing to do is just tell us your story. And as I said, I might interrupt you from time to time to make a point, but uh, welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. You're welcome. I'm an insurance agent in South Georgia. I work with Farmers Insurance and I have three grown children, five grandchildren. When I turned about 50, 51, I noticed I was having some flutters in my chest. I didn't feel just right. I thought it was the change of life, you know, normal things happening. But as it progressed, it was not. One morning I got up to go to work. We get up fairly early and I started having a heaviness in my chest. I couldn't lift my arms. I felt bad. I sat back down, gave it a time. And when I got to the doctor's office, I was in AFib, 165 to 175 beats a minute. My caregiver said, we got to get you by Amos. I said, no, my daughter works for an EP, we'll call. So we did. I was in an atrial flutter. They put me on a drug, flecainide. It went back and it progressed. I was okay for about a year and a half, two years. In 2016, my son married. And I woke up in the morning, the day of the wedding, at 242 beats a minute. I was in trouble. I had a pill in pocket. I did all the things I was told, but I went to the ER. And I was there for about 14 hours, I think it's correct. I checked myself out because I did go back into normal sinus rhythm. It was one med after another med after another med. Blood thinners. This, that. I got tired of it. So October the 28th of 16, I had my first ablation. I came home, felt like everything was fine. And in less than 30 days, I was back again with flutter. I was back again in AFib. 
peel and pocket flecainide. They tried me on metoprolol. I've been on sotalol. You name the drug, and I have been on it trying to work. In 2017, I was back in bad again. So, again, I had another ablation. My EP felt like that there was maybe just a small area that he didn't get at the time. So we went back in, and that would have been in March of 17. For about six months, I did okay. I was not on any meds. I just took the Eliquist to be sure. And then all of a sudden, I woke up one night. Here we go again. So they changed my meds again. We went back again. And in 2018, I had another ablation because I couldn't stay out of a It was constantly. One day I'd be fine. The next day I wouldn't. I was tired. I was exhausted. I felt bad. The medicines just didn't work. It was not what I needed. So in 2018, um, I went back. I had a, a link put in. So we started tracking, trying to figure out exactly what was going on. I kept hitting my phone. It was just constantly. So when the ablation was done in 2018, before I left the hospital, I was back in AFib again. I was on the toparol, and they put me on another drug, the two of them together, to try to see if they could get me stabilized. Lasted for a little bit, but it was constantly. One hour, I would be fine. Two hours later, I'd be back in a flutter. Two days later, I'd be in AFib. So I was miserable. The medications were destroying my body, and I knew that. The AFib was tearing my heart apart. So I had problems. When I went back, I questioned my EP, and he was a really great guy. He had done everything that he knew to do and what he was educated to do. And he said, well, we may can do a fourth ablation, or if that doesn't work, then the next step would be a pacemaker. Well, I was not 60 years old, and I said, no. I've got five grandchildren. I've got three children. I love my job. I have a husband. We like to travel. I said, I'm not willing to do that. I said, let me just take the medication. So he put me on the drug Sotalol then, along with the Eliquis twice a day, told me to exercise as I could. I couldn't. I, exertion. I stopped all caffeine. I stopped everything. Trial and error. If I ate at a um, Japanese restaurant, the MSGs triggered. I, I learned where my triggers were, but I was still miserable. So I started searching. I thought, there is something better out there. There's got to be somewhere. I joined every AFib group I could on social media. And then one night, I pulled up on the screen and I saw something about a wolf mini maze. So I thought, well, I've tried everything else. Let's look and see what this is. So I posted some things down in the article. And Sandy Shemire reached out for me. And she said, you're very similar to me. I'd had three ablations, and two cardioverts in less than three years, and my medication had probably been changed six or seven times, and I was still having trouble. So she sent me some of the videos of the actual procedure for the wolf mini maze. I looked at them. I thought, finally, maybe I found some hope. I spoke back with her. I called my EP doctor and spoke with his nurse, and she said, well, I'll mention it to him, and he told me, he said, well, it's an option. I'm aware of things going, he said, but I can't do the procedure. I said, okay. I said, if I have the procedure done, will you continue to be my electrophysiologist? And he said, sure. He said, I'll be glad to work. So in June of 20, I sent the um, first email and reached out to Dr. Wolf and his staff, Kimberly, his nurse Kimberly. And they answered me back. We set up some telemeds. We started. COVID was at the height. Oh, COVID was horrible. So we had to change a couple appointments because here we go. COVID's in the picture again. And I was scheduled to fly out, and they still hadn't opened up the operating room. And I was one of the first patients that when they opened back up that Dr. Wolf did the procedure on. I went into surgery in AFib at 177 beats a minute. The soda law was not doing me any good. The meds had not done anything. I fought everywhere I could to try to get relief. When I got there, Dr. Wolf was very kind to me. The nurses, I've never been in a hospital that has ever treated me with as much kindness, dignity, and respect. They met every need that I needed. 
Dr. Wolf was there. He said, I'll see you before surgery. And he did, made me feel totally comfortable. When I came out of surgery, I was in normal sinus rhythm for the first time. I felt a calm in my body that I had never felt with either of the ablations at all, but I felt it was a calm. Yes, I went through some pain. I went through some soreness. I went through the banding where you feel like you're smothering for a little bit. I had fluid. I had to take some steroids. I had to take some other meds. I was put on a heart drug that I was weaned off of. I'm weaned off of everything now. The most important thing to me was I also did not have to take blood thinner Eliquis anymore. When he clamped the top and took care of that, I don't have that problem. I lived in a fear if I bumped myself, if I cut my hand, if something happened, or if I was with one of the grandchildren, if I cut my hand, I could bleed to death because I'd been on it for so long. But I was off of Eliquis. I was off of finally all heart meds. And as of today, I am on absolutely nothing. I feel wonderful. I've been able to start walking again. Six weeks from my surgery, I went to Disney with my three-year-old grandson, Jackson, and had a blast. Was I tired? Yes. Did I have to stop and take it easy? Yes. When this procedure is done, you have to listen to your body. Your body will tell you, hey, slow down, stop. You need to heal. This is a journey. It's not something when you come out of surgery, okay, in 24 hours, I'm ready to you know, rock and roll. It doesn't work that way. It didn't work that way for me. I still feel like that I'm in the process of healing for my body, adjusting, getting used to the new me. I have no idea how long I was off and on in a field that I finally realized it. But I do know that Dr. Wolf and his team did an amazing job, an amazing job with their technique, and it has worked for me. Well, I'm glad that I saw and did the research. That's a very good summary of your story. Uh, we want to take some questions, and then I have some questions for you. Uh, okay. So uh, for all of you listening out there, uh, the questions are coming in. We're going to start answering some of them now, but we've got room for more. Uh, go to pollev.com. If you're on the web, enter DeBakey. If you're on your phone, go to DeBakey, or go to 37607 and text DeBakey, and we'll get to your question. Uh, let's take some questions here. Well, I think one came up while you were talking, Lee. So what determines the use of Sotolol versus Amiodarone after the mini maze? Okay, generally, I do not recommend Sotolol after the mini maze, but some patients are on the Sotolol before the mini maze and we leave them on that medication. Amiodarone tends to work a lot better. They both have lots of side effects, but my experience over the last 19 years has been if you're on the lowest dose of amiodarone, which is the dose that we use, the lowest dose, it's very well tolerated. Now, there were reports years ago of the side effects of amiodarone, but most of those patients were taking 800 milligrams a day for life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias, which is what amiodarone was FDA approved for. We're talking about 200 milligrams a day, so it's 25% of the dose, and some patients take 100 a day, and that's well tolerated. So my preference uh, is to use amiodarone, and it's based on whether or not the heart's out of rhythm before the mini maze. If the heart's continuously out of rhythm before the mini maze, it's, the amiodarone really seems to settle things down. It should be started a month or two before the procedure, and then continued for about 90 days after the procedure. Since most of the patients that I take care of have a link or a subcutaneous monitor, we can see every month if there's any AFib and we can wean the amiodarone rather quickly. Uh, Sotolol also is a beta blocker. It slows the heart significantly. And unfortunately, it also causes a lot of tiredness. And I don't know if you had this, but Usually you start on a low dose of Sotolol, it doesn't work that well, it works for a while, then it doesn't work that well, so then the dose is doubled. And before you know it, you're on a dose of Sotolol, where by the time you get to noon, you're done for the day. 
Exactly Did that happen correct. to you at all? Yes, that is exactly correct. The soda law was, was horrible, and, and it, they increased it twice, and it, it didn't do the job. Now, the drug, the amarodon that you put me on when, after surgery, that did. It calmed it down, and I, I tolerated it very well, and then I weaned off of it. Yeah. Now, there's an old saying, if you throw a frog in boiling water, he'll jump out. But if you put him in tepid water, which means warm water, and slowly turn up the heat, you'll cook him. And I think that's what happens with Sotolol and some of these other drugs. Uh, patients are started on a relatively low dose. They may tolerate it relatively well, but then the heat gets turned up. Let's double it because it's not working. And you go, well, I feel a little worse, but I guess I'm all right. Let's double it again. And before you know it, you're cooked. You can't get past noon. So um, these drugs are powerful drugs, but in my experience, amiodarone is the one that's best tolerated at a low dose and less than a year, generally less than a year. Uh, however, well, I, still, I if, if some people are already on the soda law and it's keeping them in rhythm before the surgery, I'll continue it. Some patients, I, I saw a patient this week and they're getting ready for surgery and they've been on soda law, but they're out of rhythm all the time. So why take it? It's not working. So in those cases, we'll stop the soda law and start the amiodarone, which is still the most effective of the antirhythmic drugs, particularly perioperatively. That means around the time of the surgery. Um, what percentage of AFib occurs in the LAA? So this is a, a good question discussing the left atrial appendage, uh, which was closed in your case, and I've been doing it in all cases for almost 20 years. What does it look like? Well, let's go to the slides. Mr. and Ms. Producer will go to the slides, and I will show this slide here and see if we can get it to run. And there you can see the pericardium open. This is exactly what we did in, uh, in your case, Lisa. That's the appendage. It's an appendix of the heart. In fact, it used to be called the appendix of the heart. And in this case, we're using a clip. So now the appendage is closed. And then we'll release the, the clip from the applicator. And this takes maybe five minutes to put on. Very safe. And once this is on, one does not have to take blood thinners for AFib for the rest of your life, even if your heart's out of rhythm. And for many patients uh, who come to see me, that's their main concern is they want to stop the blood thinners. What percent of these patients have this coming from their uh, AFib or is, a, is a, the cause of their AFib? We don't know the answer to that. Uh, certainly I've had many experiences where we're performing the procedure and as soon as we close the appendage, then the AFib disappears and it stays gone. And we now have patients 18 and 19 years out with no recurrence of the AFib. I, and the patient that I was operating on, operating on yesterday, I was pretty sure the, the left atrial appendage was invo involved uh, because as soon as we isolated the appendage, the, a the AFib stopped. You couldn't get the heart to go out of rhythm. If the appendage is large, it may be big enough to sustain what we call a macro reentrant circuit or electricity going around like a merry-go-round. And once that circuit is stopped by closing the appendage, then that macro reentrant circuit stops and the AFib disappears. Does the atrial clip stop AFib coming from the LAA? It does. Uh, it's another good question. That clip electrically isolates the appendage. It not only closes off the appendage to the heart, which prevents strokes. And by the way, uh, when Lisa's taking Aliquis, she's decreasing her risk of stroke by 60%. Well, 60% is okay, but it's not that great. Mm. Closing the appendage, like you see here, decreases the risk of stroke by 97%. And you don't have to take blood thinners anymore. 
Some of the patients I see come to have the mini maze because they've had a stroke while on blood thinners, but their stroke was from the blood thinner. Their blood got too thin and they had what's called a hemorrhagic stroke. Now, because the clip closes the appendage completely, it electrically isolates the appendage. The watchman does not. The watchman does not electrically isolate the appendage. The watchman is more like a cork putting inside the appendage, but the electrical activity of the appendage is still intact. So there's a big difference between using a watchman or closing it with a clip. The clip electrically isolates it and helps prevent AFib, and the clip is 100% closed, no leaks. An article, or well, a, pre a presentation was made yesterday, American College of Cardiology, that showed with the watchman, the stroke rate, in fact, went up after the placement of the watchman. They said it was a significant increase in stroke after the watchman was put in because in 25% of the patients, the watchman didn't close the appendage off completely. Uh, Let's hit a couple more here, and thanks for, these are great, great questions. Keep them coming. You'll see at the bottom of the screen how you can join the conversation. Comments are all okay as well. Um, does Inspire work for sleep apnea? I am not an expert. This is not my area of expertise, so I don't think I should give out comments on Inspire. However, it is known that if atrial fibrillation is present and the sleep apnea is not corrected, that there's a, about a 44% increase in the recurrence of the AFib. So certainly treatment of the sleep apnea, and there are many ways to treat it, is of paramount importance in the overall management of atrial fibrillation. Now the other part of the question is, can you have it, the Inspire, with the link since both are implanted in the chest. Uh, as far as I know, yes, we have implanted links in patients who have neuromodulation for essential tremor, uh, in patients that have AICDs, pacemakers, uh, spinal implants, and that has not so far interfered uh, with the, the link and it's sending the signal to us with the EKG. If the measurement of success is the elimination of the need for blood thinners and antiarrhythmic meds, then what is your success rate after the, I guess they probably got cut off with a, a word limit there. Um, the elimination of the need for blood thinner is 100%. So we're 100% on that. On antiarrhythmic meds, we're close to that, but not complete. And interestingly, and you would never think this before, but I know this from experience. We have a few people that take one pill, one amiodarone pill a week, not one a day, one a week, and that's enough to keep them in rhythm. So we have some patients, very few, that are still on some antiarrhythmic medications, but it's less than probably 5%. So we're looking at a overall plus minus 5% uh, total from what I say for AFib. Now, the success rate for the AFib depends on what type of AFib we're dealing with. If it's paroxysmal AFib, the kind where it comes and goes, never lasts for more than seven days, never had a cardioversion, we're about 95 chances out of 100 of beating it. If it's persistent AFib, which means cardioversions have been performed, like with Lisa, uh, or you've had it continuously for more than seven days, it goes down to about 85 chances out of 100, plus or minus five. If it's long-standing persistent, in other words, the heart's been out of rhythm for over a year, then it goes down to about 75 chances out of 100. But this is enormously better than a catheter ablation. Recently in our own institution, a uh, publication was made on the persistent AFib, and they were touting the good results of doing a little bit extra tweak on the uh, catheter ablation. <clears throat> and their one year persistent catheter ablation in rhythm rate 
went from mid-30s to mid-40s. 46% of patients were in rhythm a year after the catheter ablation with a little tweaking. And that was 10% better or 9% better than the 35 or 36 or 37%. Um, those are pretty low. So if your heart is out of rhythm continuously, you're much more likely to get back in rhythm with a mini maze versus a, a catheter ablation. Uh, Lisa, question for you, my dear. Lisa, did you have any family history of AFib? Uh, by the way, Dr. Wolf, I'm nine weeks from procedure and I'm feeling great. So Lisa, uh, family history. Not to my knowledge. I had a grandmother that had hypertension terribly and they put a pacemaker in because her heart, the doctor at that time just said he couldn't keep it the beat where it needed to be. They didn't call it arrhythmia. So not to my knowledge. I have okay. no idea where it came from. Well, this is all complicated too by the fact that many years ago, if your grandmother passed away, they may have been an AFib and never made the diagnosis, never got an EKG. Um, also, uh, by the way, <clears throat> you mentioned in your presentation that uh, a pacemaker might have been in your future and that's when you decided to look for other options. Uh, hopefully they told you, but I'm curious to ask, did they tell you the pacemaker wouldn't stop your fib or flutter, you just wouldn't feel it? No. But Because I think that's an important point. I think some people who are, are on this journey of AFib uh, misunderstand that if they get a pacemaker as a last resort and an AV node ablation, that that will cure their AFib, and that is not true. A pacemaker- He didn't tell me that. He didn't tell you I that. I was not told that. He just said that was just an option. And I, I knew from, from doing research that once that's done, they're gonna burn the whole area out and there's nothing there. So no, I wasn't ready for that. Well, you're correct. Your own pacemaker wouldn't work anymore. And the idea of that therapy is to burn your own pacemaker out so those high heart rates that you had would go away, but your heart would still be fibrillating. So you still got the risk of stroke, you still got the risk of heart dysfunction. And in all honesty, there are many papers that show that in 25% of people, people with AFib who have a pacemaker, their heart function doesn't improve, it goes down. The heart function deteriorates. So pacemaker isn't even always the answer to improve your heart condition or your ejection fraction. But a key point is a pacemaker for AFib will not stop your AFib. It will make you dependent on that pacemaker because it goes along oftentimes with the AV node ablation. Um, no, another question. What, and all, all good questions, and we have room for some more, so keep the good questions coming. What is a flutter ablation and when would you get one? I have AFib, but I don't really tell the difference between the two, meaning the difference between flutter and fib. Uh, in my experience, patients have told me that flutter feels worse than fib because there are many patients that have fib, then they have catheter ablation, then they have atypical left atrial flutter. We never heard about left atrial flutter until catheter ablations came along. There was right atrial flutter, which is called typical, and that is best treated with a catheter ablation. A catheter ablation is an excellent treatment for typical or right atrial flutter. But now we have essentially a, mm, what would you call it, a, uh, a marked increase in a very rare thing, which is left atrial or atypical uh, flutter. Uh, and that is from the catheter ablation usually being incomplete. So you get these little macro reentrant circuits that are going around in the atrium that create an atrium that's beating very fast and the ventricle starts beating fast too. Um, so most patients have told me the flutter is worse than the fib. Now, Initially, I did not treat left atrial flutter with a mini maze 
because I didn't understand it. But there were some cases where I did the mini maze in patients with left atrial flutter, mainly to close the appendage. But I did the whole mini maze and their flutter went away. And then I started testing like I showed you at the top of the hour, looking at the pulmonary veins. And it became clear that the reason the patients had the left atrial flutter was because of the catheter ablation. And then if you made a complete line, like the mini maze does with the clamp, then you eliminate the atypical left atrial flutter. And I think, Lisa, you're a prime example of that. Would you, does that make sense to you? You're mesmerized yes, now, aren't I'll you? Yes, I agree. Yes, <laughs> yes. I agree. The flutter, whoo, it'll yeah. take you on a roller coaster. Right. So um, the difference is usually the flutter is wet, less well tolerated. It's associated with a high heart rate that's hard to control, which is what you had. You often had a yeah. very high heart rate, which was difficult to control. And by the time they gave you enough medicines to control that high heart rate from the flutter, you felt like a zombie, right? Exactly. That is correct. So, I mean, you don't want either one, but if you had to pick your poison, I'd pick the atrial fib over the A-flutter, which is a little easier to control uh, medically. The good news is that the mini maze now can treat the atypical left atrial flutter and the AFib equally well. If you have, but if you have typical right atrial flutter, that's treated better with a catheter ablation. But if you have both, then I would, I would treat the fib and, and you might find out the flutter goes away as well. Uh, next question is, would you expect elevated lymphocytes to be related to the Wolf Mini Maze at six months after surgery? Oh, that's a tricky question. So elevated lymphocytes, lymphocytes are what fight off infection. And they, by the way, they fight off viral infections. So I would be more suspect of a COVID vaccine or a booster or a COVID infection causing elevated lymphocytes than the Wolf Mini Maze. The Wolf Mini Maze generally doesn't elevate your lymphocytes. Um, the, if you take steroids, your leukocytes go up a little bit for a while, but the lymphocytes may be related, more related to a viral infection. And in this environment with the pandemic, you might suspect a COVID origin, or it could be the flu, it could be the flu. After a successful Wolf Mini Maze procedure like mine, when would you say it's safe to start back outdoor activities like <laughs> 5K runs and mountain biking? <laughs> well, uh, I'll, I'll let you answer first. Well, you probably don't do mountain biking, do you, Lisa? No, I don't do mountain bike, but I walk and I live in the country. So you can do it when your body tells you to. When you feel like it, you can do it. Your body will let you know. Well, that's a great answer, and that is true. But uh, from the, I guess from the surgical standpoint, uh, they may want to know, well, is it safe? Uh, can I tear something right. loose? And the answer is you can't. Um, I've, I've had people go skydiving a few months after the mini maze uh, or scuba diving, all kinds of things. I mean, I wouldn't go bungee jumping the next week, uh, but generally you can't tear anything loose. There's nothing to tear loose. So I think you gave the correct answer. When your body feels like it, then it's okay to do it. And generally can, what I tell, can tell, what's that? You, you can tell. When I, when I left the hospital and went back to the hotel room, I rested that day. I was tired. But the next day, we got out and we walked. We went all over several of the sites in Houston. Mm -hmm. And then when I got home, I went back to work four hours a day the next week. Um, I was in Texas about two weeks because I got my link put in and waited to make sure everything was okay. I went back to work four hours a day. And then at six weeks, like I said, we went to Disney in Florida. So your body will tell you what you can and can't do. I, you know, yeah. again, I didn't tear anything loose. Well, the, um, in general, I tell patients who are very active, you can start the lower body activity as you did with the walking right away. 
and the upper body and the lifting if you're doing barbells or something like that you might want to wait a couple weeks and let things settle down uh, one uh, wonderful lady who joined us for a webcast early on here uh, is an attorney in Chicago and she flew out from Chicago had her mini maze flew back by herself drove herself from the from the airport back to her home and was back at work the next week now she wasn't doing running 5Ks, but she was back at it. But you, exactly. but I guess the key point on the surgeon side is you really can't tear anything loose. So you're right, Lisa. Uh, let's see, Dr. Wolf, what is your opinion on the possible efficacy of vagal therapies, medications, or stimulation devices on AFib and stomach issues like GERD? Well, boy, this is a, a near and dear to me. Uh, as you know, I have a fundamentally different approach to AFib, which attacks the outside of the heart and the autonomic nerves and their mixed vagal, which is called parasympathetic, and the sympathetic nerves. And these are the nerves that makes your hands sweat when you look over the top of a tall building over the edge. Uh, they're the nerves that make your heart rate go fast when you're watching a scary movie. Why should your heart rate increase? Uh, you're sitting in a chair. So these are the fight or flight nerves. These are the nerves that helped us escape a lion chasing after us a long, long time ago. And now these nerves don't respond to lions chasing after us, but they respond to stress. And as many of you know, stress comes in many different forms. Uh, but sometimes there's an, it develops an imbalance of that autonomic nervous system on the outside of your heart. And guess where these nerves are generally very abundant? Right around the pulmonary veins. But they're not on the inside of the pulmonary veins. They're on the outside. And it's very difficult to isolate any of these nerves on the outside of the vein going from the inside. So my approach is go where the money is, which is the outside of the heart test these nerves, treat these nerves, go ahead and make a line, do a full ablation, and that'll treat the AFib. So I'm a big believer in the vagal therapies. We've had many patients who told me that after their, they've had the mini maze and their AFib is gone, that their stomach issues go away too because the next stop on the vagal nerve highway is the stomach. And these are the nerves that cause increased acid secretion and can cause peptic ulcers. Had one patient who had uh, Raynaud's really bad. In other words, he's a rancher, and whenever the temperature went below 50 degrees outside, all his fingers turned white. Had it all his life. Did the mini maze on him about six years ago. The year after the mini maze, he called me up and said, Doc, I don't know what you did, but I can go outside now and my fingers don't turn white. So this autonomic system that we have is very complicated. We don't understand it as well as we'd like to, but I'm convinced it's the major player for lone AFib. Now, if there's a bad mitral valve and the left heart's enlarged, that's different. But we're talking about lone AFib, like what Lisa had. You don't have heart problems otherwise. And I think you had a normal heart. And I think most people that have lone AFib have a normal heart. So burning it up is not the answer, I don't think. The answer is to control no. what initiates the AFib, which are the nerves on the outside. That's kind of a long uh, answer, but it could be a lot longer. This is a very interesting topic. There was an article that came out not too long ago of people zapping uh, the vagus uh, on the spine and decreasing AFib after heart surgery. So this is a, a very interesting area of research. Uh, what percent of your cases required a secondary ablation? In those cases where an additional ablation was required, what was the final overall success? Another good question. It generally depends, generally depends on how long the heart was out of rhythm before the mini maze. If the heart's been out of rhythm continuously for more than one year before the mini maze, then there's a slight increased chance that a follow-up ablation would be necessary. If patients have had multiple ablations before the mini maze, 
it slightly increases the chance that a follow-up ablation may be necessary. Uh, so there are factors we can look at, but if someone has, hi, I see in the background there. Oh, she closed the door. Is that your, is that your? Uh, that's my staff. That's, that's my your staff. staff? Okay. <laughs> Little cameo appearance there. Um, if, um, so it depends on what the situation is, but generally speaking, if a patient has not had previous ablations and has not had cardioversions, it's unlikely to need a follow-up ablation. The overall follow-up ablation rate is probably around 5%, but these are mostly in patients that have been out of rhythm for more than a year or who have had previous catheter ablations before the mini maze. Uh, overall success is unbelievably good. This surprises even me. Uh, I've been working with Dr. Fahed here for a few years on the catheter ablation side, and he's got about 100% success going back after a mini maze. He, he tells me, he says, Randy, it's much, much easier than a regular catheter ablation. The pulmonary veins are isolated, the appendage is closed, and he says, I can go in and concentrate on a spot here or there and take care of it, and that's been pretty much 100% successful. Uh, so if the heart's been out of rhythm continuously for a long time, do the mini maze. If the heart's still out of rhythm, do a cardioversion a month later. If the heart's still out of rhythm six months later, consider the catheter ablation. And that's been a very good road to go down uh, for, in our practice. Uh, is there a recommended maximum heart rate during the healing we should try to keep under while exercising or when exercising? Uh, was this a, now you, uh, Lisa, you had a very fast heart rate before the mini maze. It was a big part of your problem. As you mentioned, when you were here at, at Methodist and about to go to surgery, your heart rate was like 170 or something. It uh, was. I carried a, I carried a high heart rate. Now, since my surgery, it's down. It's, it's elevated a little bit. And what I mean elevated, it may hit 90. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's lower than that. But as far as exercising, um, one of the first times I took a walk, I, I walked about a half a mile after I got home, about the third week. And it went up to like 115, 120. But then it slowly, as my body healed and as my heart got adjusted to the change, then it started slowly coming down. So yeah. it's staying 85 to 90 right now. Um, if, if we look at the... Um definition of normal sinus rhythm. It's a sinus rhythm with a heart rate between 60 and 100. That's okay. the generally accepted definition of normal sinus rhythm. If the heart rate is sinus rhythm but below 60, it's called bradycardia. If it's normal rhythm but faster than 100, it's called tachycardia. So anywhere well, from one of the dr mm -hmm. one of the drugs that they gave me, and I don't remember which one it was now, but it dropped my heart rate. I would wake up in the mornings and it would be forty or forty two, and I felt so bum. I couldn't do that. Yeah, that's that'll that'll take away your energy. Uh, so anyway, generally sixty to a hundred is fine. Uh, occasionally we'll see patients that'll be a little bit higher than a hundred. As long as it's sinus rhythm, that's okay. If the heart rate's 120, it's probably not sinus rhythm. And we see this sometimes, and it can happen post-operatively. We have this blanking period for about 90 days, just like catheter ablation. Uh, but usually if I see that, I'm suspicious that there's flutter. The flutter can be very regular, <clears throat> and, it, and the EKG will miss it, and sometimes the physicians will miss it. They'll miss it in the emergency room, uh, but and they call it sinus tachycardia, but it isn't. It's really atrial flutter. So if you get up about 120, 123, uh, or to 150, that's usually flutter. Typical right atrial flutter is 150 beats per minute. Typical, atypical atrial flutter uh, is usually around 123 to 125 uh, beats per minute. Uh, so, uh, you know, as you increase your activity, uh, your heart rate going up is good. The opposite happens for a while after the mini maze. It's a little bit harder to jump your heart rate up really high because we have modulated the autonomic nerves. 
people who are marathon runners who've had uh, the procedure with me have stated that when they go out and start running a lot, they have to go slowly at first. They can't just take off in a gallop. They have to slowly increase uh, because their, their response is a little slower uh, after the mini maze for several months as far as increasing heart rate quickly. If you have a pacemaker, is there any time after the maze you can have the pacemaker removed? Well, the short answer is yes, and I have done it occasionally. I don't generally recommend it because most pacemakers include wires that go from the heart out through the veins to around your shoulder. There's some risk in extracting those wires. Pacemaker lead extraction is a procedure that has a small but real risk of pulling that wire and making a hole in the vein. Uh, and I've had to take care of those patients when that's happened before in the cath lab. So if the pacemaker isn't bothering you, it's a risk versus benefit thing. And the risk is here and the benefit of taking out is probably here. You probably want to leave it in. If there's some other compelling reason to take it out, that's okay. Uh, the pacemaker is a backup if it's a dual, lead, dual chamber pacemaker. It can also pace the atrium. That's an advantage after the mini maze. And also the pacemaker stores information. So much like a link, it can store the information and allow your physicians to see what percent of time your heart is staying in rhythm. In Lisa's case with the link, I think we're batting at 100% right now, batting 1,000. Um, what percent of people develop pleural effusions from the Wolf Mini Maze that require treatment? It's about f maybe less than 5%. Uh, the, your pleural cavities turn over a liter of fluid a day. That's right, I said a liter. You know what a liter of Coke is, but your pleural cavities turn over that much fluid every day in your body. That's fluid that's secreted by the inside lining of your lung and then is reabsorbed by the tissue around the lung. That's normal. So sometimes if that's interrupted temporarily, there'll be some buildup of fluid or it could be from inflammation. And that can require steroids and Lasix, most commonly to treat, occasionally drawing off the fluid which is usually curative. Very rarely do we have to put a tube in and drain that fluid. Also keep in mind, some people that develop that also have some other issues. They may have a history of heart failure. They may have a history of some liver difficulty or some kidney difficulties. That increases the possibility that you may have a pleural effusion. Does magnesium really help your heart and help with AFib? What do you think? Lisa, what do you think? You're laughing. I tried it. I've tried a little bit of everything. I do think you need magnesium. I think there needs to be a balance in your body. I do understand that. It's a very expensive test to have that done to make sure it's correct. But I don't take that now. I'm absolutely not taking anything. I tried that. Magnesium taurate is what I took um, at one time. I couldn't tell any difference, Dr. Wolf. I really couldn't. Yeah. Well, part of the problem is there's so many triggers for AFib. And if you ask 50 people what their triggers are, you probably get about 30 different answers. Exactly. Um, most of magnesium, from a physio physiological standpoint, the majority of the magnesium in your body is inside the cells, 99.9%. .9%. So when you measure magnesium in the blood, you're looking at just a tiny, tiny sliver of what your body's really using. So I don't know if it helps or not. I say to people, if you think it does help, continue to take it because it's fairly safe to take it. Uh, it's not safe on your pocketbook, but it's uh, safe from a medical standpoint. It can be expensive, if you, as you noticed. But sometimes um, I wonder if it's really doing anything. I don't think it'll keep you out of rhythm consistently. And it didn't with you. No, it did not. How do you know if you have right or left atrial flutter? Well, 
Uh, generally with an EKG or ECG is the proper name, electrocardiogram, I can tell if it's right or left flutter. Not always, but mostly. Right atrial flutter is usually right at where the atrium's at 300 beats a minute and the ventricle's at 150 beats per minute. So you can tell on the rate. Also, you can see what we call a typical sawtooth pattern where you'll see two little P waves before every V wave. Uh, so it's typical is usually 150 of the ventricle, 300 in the atrium, and you can see the sawtooth pattern. Left atrial flutter is not as consistent. You'll see a, a, a variability in the heart-to-heart -heart rate, whereas typical, it's right at 150. You'll see with left atrial flutter, it's, it's not as typical. So a experienced reader of ECGs can usually tell. There are other more sophisticated ways to tell, but usually a 12-lead EKG is sufficient. Well, we've burned through about an hour. Um, uh, I asked you before we started, we don't give out phone numbers, but if you wanted to share your email, if someone has a burning question for you, and you said you would be okay with that. So would you sure. mind, would you mind uh, giving that out now and say it a couple times slowly? I will. My email is Lisa, G-I-A, at bellsouth.net. Again, it's Lisa, L-I-S-A, G-I-A, at bell, B-E-L-L, south, S-O-U-T-H, dot net. What's the G-I-A? General Insurance Agency is my old agency that I own. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And any closing comments? Um uh, again, thank you for being on the program. Any closing comments, anything else you wanted to say to our audience? Again, just thank you for allowing me to, to, to be here and to share my experience. You know, three ablations, two cardioverts, and now I'm in a maze, and I feel wonderful. Dr. Wolf, you do an extremely wonderful job, and so do your staff. Well, thank my you. My recommendation, I'll tell anyone, if you're having problems, reach out and look and research and check your options. Don't just settle for what an EP tells you. Okay, I think that's a, that's a very, very reasonable uh, suggestion. Um, and um, I think in closing, uh, there, uh, there is still hope after you've had failed ablations, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes yes, people lose hope. hope and you shouldn't lose hope. And I think the most important thing that we try to do here is make it so people can worry about other things in their heart every day. And it Amen. sounds like you're about to that point. It's a wonderful thing to wake up and not be afraid that you're going to go into AFib or you can't breathe, or you're going to smother because your heart's beating so fast you don't know what to do. So yes, the journey, it's been worth the journey and the journey's going to get better. And if you, and it, it always bothered me when the, an ablation was done and said, well, you can't have wine anymore or you can't have a glass of beer. Or, and I thought, well, you know, that's part of living your life. You don't want to be in fear of taking a drink once in a while, right? No, fear's gone. Fear's gone. I promise. Fear's gone. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks again for being with us, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll be back again, I believe, in a, in a month. Uh, I don't know if the, we'll be back to our regular time of 5 p.m. or not. Producers, you probably don't know the answer to that question either right now. But we'll put it out there on Facebook and the usual places. Uh, until then, thank you for all your great questions. The hour flew by. Lisa, uh, you did a great job. Thanks for joining us, and uh, have a wonderful summer. Thanks, everybody.